Okay, this is Trinity Sunday. So it's the first Sunday after Pentecost, and that is traditionally celebrated within Christendom as Trinity Sunday, a celebration of the doctrine of the Trinity of God. Although it is my suspicion that in most Christian churches this morning, uh, nobody's going to hear about the Trinity. It may be printed in the bullet in some place. It may be referenced marginally. But the problem with preaching about the Trinity is that the Trinity is not a function of biblical theology. It doesn't actually arise within the Bible. And so unless you're a part of a orthodox or a more liturgical uh, denomination, you're not going to hear anything about the Trinity. Um, and, and a part of that is because it's... Uh, it's a hard doctrine to get our heads around. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin this morning a series of uh, homilies about the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, probably continuing all the way through June. We're going to be talking about this because it's, it, is, uh, it is a genuinely complex notion. First of all, <clears throat> most biblical scholars and historians will agree that the doctrine of the Trinity of God is not something that is found in the Bible. We do find references to God as Father. Jesus referred to God as Abba. It's a, cup, a kind of a nickname for, it's like Daddy. Uh, certainly Jesus was um, celebrated as the Son of God. So we've got the Father and the Son. And Jesus referenced the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so the idea of the Holy Spirit or the, the Holy Ghost those three concepts as relative to the meaning of God are definitely present in the Bible. What is not present is the idea of the three of them being in some sense co-creative of this common element, which is God. So the Trinity, <clears throat> the Trinity functionally is a sort of post-biblical theology. Now, <clears throat> This is actually really good news for us because it, it sets us free, it offers us a promise, and it also sets forth a challenge. The freedom comes from the fact that um, because the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity is not biblical, it arose um, fairly early in the life of the church relative to today, but uh, it was something that was discerned as a, a present reality of God that was not something that was referenced by directly referenced as a concept by the biblical authors, which means <laughs> we, don't we are not limited to our understanding of, of God to that which is present within the biblical writings. And certainly the, the Bible as a collection of writings from multiple authors they don't they did not all have the same concept of the nature of god so this is a very freeing uh development for us insofar as we can construct our own relationship with god second thing it is is that it is a promise um the uh <clears throat> the doctrine of the of the trinity is hard to get your heads hard to get our heads around it is a um it is a, 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 of the nature of a complementarity um a complementarity is a an understanding that says that there are multiple ways of looking at this thing and you can only understand this thing when you can see it from multiple points of view uh, an example of a complementarity is light light is light a particle or is it a wave and it is both, but you cannot fully understand the nature of light unless you understand it as both particle and wave. In a similar way, understanding of the nature of the divine is, at least as it is asserted through the doctrine of the Trinity, is that it, we only understand it fully when we can understand it from the perspective of these three parts. Um, so it's freeing because we get to decide, we get to play with our own ideas of the nature of God. It is a promise in that as we contemplate it, we, be, we become more and more able to appreciate uh, what this doctrine is telling us, what it reveals to us. And it's a challenge <clears throat> because it's hard to get our heads around this notion. It's, it, is, it is something that is only available to us to the degree to which we can actually think in complex terms. So 
if you really want to be able to think in complex terms, this is a great thing, for, <laughs> great thing to contemplate because it will help push you there. <clears throat> so, freedom, promise, challenge. However, uh, I, I want to be clear that I do not find as the most helpful formulation of the Trinity of God, the persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. Father and Son are both masculine notions, so the patriarchal excesses of the church are sometimes um, emphasized uh, by, the, by the use of, oh, well, it's God's Father, God's not Mother, God's... And so we, we place gender on the divine that limits the nature of what we can understand God to be. And Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, spiritualism, ghosts are scary. I don't, I don't want to be associated with... So the whole idea of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is just has some serious problems. And it also suggests that those are the only three persons that we can envision as the Trinity, and that's very limiting because the primary understanding of the Trinity is not that it is these three persons, but that it is a set of relationships between persons and that it is the relational nature of God that's what's really more important. So in this series that I'm proposing, this series of homilies, I'm going to hold out to you that God is, that, that the concept of Trinity is really very valuable to us, but I'm going to propose to us three different persons. And I'm going to talk to God, uh, talk, talk about God as creator God, the creator as the source of being, the source of our reality, as mind of God. That is, the mind of God is that which is the higher wisdom to which we are all drawn. And the love of God, which is the nature of God that is sort of the glue that holds everything together. So it is these three concepts of God as, uh, let me accentuate this for us. So creator God, mind of God, and love of God. And so I'm going to hold these up to us as sort of our examples of, or, or as uh, persons to which we can refer as we seek to understand with greater depth the nature of God. But I want to close out this segment by telling you a story. Something that happened to me back when I was in seminary myself in the mid seventies. Uh, my uh, my wife and I had Kate and I had recently married, and we were living in this huge house on Walnut Avenue in Newton Center, Massachusetts, just down the hill from Andover Newton, the seminary uh, at which I was a student. And we were living there because I was working as the uh, the teacher for a confirmation class for a Catholic house church that owned that house. And they gave us housing as a way of compensating me for my work for them. And all the comings and goings that happened in the house, we lived on the second floor of this house, and all the comings and goings always came through the back door, back by the, by the garage and the kitchen, and everybody came and went there because there were, you could park on the street back there. Main Street, Walnut, was way too busy. <clears throat> but one afternoon, a Wednesday afternoon, there was a knock on the front door. Nobody ever came to the front door. I went to the front door. Obviously, this person didn't know what they were doing, knocked, uh, knocking on the door. I opened up the door. There was a young man of about my age who wanted to talk to me about Jesus. And I thought, great, I love to talk to you about Jesus. No, he didn't want me to tell him about Jesus. He wanted, he wanted to tell me about Jesus. <clears throat> I don't know what sect he was a part of, but he was doing his rounds and talking to people and trying to save their souls. So I explained to him that I was a student in seminary and that this was not a necessary conversation for him to have. And this did not dissuade him one bit. He was all the more eager to try and talk to me. And we had a, we had a very, we sat down, had a pleasant conversation. And in fact, it was pleasant enough. That we agreed that we were going to continue to do it. We could sort of have you know, our dueling theologies. <clears throat> so we had done this for three, four weeks in a row, perhaps, I don't know, but stretched on into the, probably the fourth session that we had. And, and our conversation went particularly long that afternoon. We met at four each Wednesday afternoon and it had stretched into the dinner hour and Kate came in to where I was sitting with him and said, uh, supper is ready and turned to him and said, would you like to join us? And he said, oh, 
well, yes, that would be wonderful. And so we found another chair and sat at our very small table in the kitchen and sat down to eat. And I, told, I turned to him and I said, is our custom uh, before we eat to pray, would you pray for it, pray with us? And he said, no. And I was, what? <laughs> it's like, what? You, wouldn't, you, you, don't, you don't want to pray with us? Why is that? He said, because it's become clear to me that we do not pray to the same God, which was actually true and rather observant of him and rather brave, I thought of him to actually say so. And now these 40 years later, 50 years later, uh, that's the only thing I can remember us talking about. Of all of the things over those weeks when we spoke about various the theological principles, that he pointed out to me, that it was clear to him that he and I did not pray to the same God, did not hold up us the same understanding of the nature of God. Uh, that was what really, that's what really has stuck with me. It really is true that um, who I then, my, the concept that I had then of the nature of God and the concept that I have now is not the same. My image of God is really quite dynamic, even not just from year to year, epic to epic, but from moment to moment. And in fact, in any worshiping congregation, I dare say there are no two people in the whole congregation that have exactly the same understanding of the nature of God, even though they may believe that they do. And in fact, it is real that our diversity is constructive of the nature of God. So one of the things I'm going to assert in this series is that even as we are created by God, we create God in so far as we develop a vision of the nature of God and that having a nature, having an understanding of the nature of God that takes into account the inherent complexity of reality is freeing. It offers a promise. It's a challenge. And it is a, uh, a spiritual discipline all in its own. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to continue this and we're going to be looking at uh, what it is to <clears throat> discover our relationship with the Trinity over these next weeks. Thanks for joining me.